Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, you know, thank you for having me here at SoulCon. It's my favorite show of the year. Um, one of my favorite shows, but definitely, you know, my favorite show of the year. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm J.M. Hunter, and um, currently I am a graduate um, attending at, uh, for an M MFA in comics program at California College of the Arts, based here. Um, while I attend that school, I'm actually based outside of Columbus, Ohio, near Columbus, and I currently work in the mediums of genres of memoir, um, intersectional, you know, multidisciplinary when it comes to culture, comics, race, identity, politics, social issues, and then satire. And I use all mediums, basically, analog, uh, traditional fine art, as well as digital. And whatever gets me my story, whatever um, allows me to tell my story or helps me with my voice is pretty much what I work on. Um, I am, uh, I have my other partner who's also part of SoulCon is Guy Copes the third. We're both part of Angry Artist Studios because we're both Generation X and, you know, have to be 90s edgy and all that kind of thing. So um, I am a Black, Filipino, Native American, German, Hungarian um, uh, creator and um, father of three. And my better half is upstairs teaching fifth graders right now. So. Shout out to the teachers who are doing this, this really difficult work over Zoom. Um, Rob, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Sure. What's up, everybody? My name is Robert Luther Hill. I'm an author, illustrator from Oakland, California, and I got the amazing chance to uh, go to SoulCon last year and actually visit Columbus, which was awesome. So great to meet you, Caitlin and uh, Frederick and all the Columbus homies. Um, excited to be here. Uh, my background is uh, African-American, Mexican, Korean, and Apache Indian, and I do children's books, mostly picture books, but I work in uh, middle grade and early readers as well. And I've been a lifelong artist doing uh, murals, illustration, things like that. And I'm really juiced to um, contribute to some awesome storytelling. I was trying to skip the sirens that of course started just now. Um, Majed, can you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Majid Badra. I'm a comic artist and a political cartoonist. Uh, currently, I'm a student at Columbus College of Art and Design with two majors in comic practice and also illustration, and another minor in creative writing. I will graduate this semester. Uh, the genres that I focus on are uh, comics, uh, journalism, comics memoir, and fiction. Uh, and when it comes to illustration, I focus on uh, surre surrealism as well. Uh, of course, uh, political cartoons. Uh, for the academic research, uh, I, I have done some articles and uh, I focus on comics journalism war, um, and, and war journalism and peace journalism in a, terms, uh, in a term that I, I, I came up with. It's called uh, comics peace journalism that I'm gonna try to work on uh, in a grad school. Um, so I, I wrote articles about art and refugees, post-colonialism on art, uh, nonviolent resistance uh, and comics. So colonialism and post-colonialism and, uh, uh, and relate them to art. Basically, my work focused on the political narrative that encounters the Western narrative uh, because it's influenced by colonialism, orientalism, and um, war journalism. Excellent. Thank you, Majid. And then our dynamic duo. I also really quickly, I don't mean to embarrass you, Dr. Elvira, but I would love it if in the chat you can drop those congratulations because we have a doctora among us because she's passed her PhD. Um, so we've got Dr. Elvira in the house as well as Ronnie. So tell us about yourselves, our dynamic duo. Yay, thank you, Dukes comics.com. Um, hi, everyone. Yes, I just got my doctorate degree this past August from the University of Texas at El Paso in rhetoric and composition. Thank you. And it's a huge deal because I'm the first in my family to, to even go to college. And so, and I have a family and, and some first generation college. Thank you. And so it's been a huge 
um, I guess, endeavor, a huge challenge in my life. And I'm just really happy to be where I'm at. Um, but one thing I will say during my doctoral journey these past five years, I had the pleasure and honor of being able to attend SoulCon. Uh, we were invited by um, Dr. Aldama and, and actually Nicole. I met Nicole uh, Pizarro Colon at uh, DMAC. So I, so I was in Ohio for a rhetoric and composition institute. So I was there for academic reasons. And then, but it was like meant to be because then we met Frederick, we met uh, Nicole and, and we got to go to SoCon a couple of years ago and now here we are, we're back. Um, so I'm a writer. Um, I, you know, my thing is fiction, but I definitely base my stories on nonfiction, on the politics and, and social cultural context, um, specifically of the U.S. border, which is where I'm from, uh, El Paso, Texas and Chaparral, New Mexico. This is where I grew up. Um, and so I just have always wanted to sort of uh, just tell my story and, and kind of share my experience growing up here. Um, and uh, so I've done all kinds of writing, journalism, playwriting, film. I went to film school. And then of course now, you know, as a PhD, I'm trying to do academic work, which specifically I want to center artists of color um, and writers. Uh, so my dissertation was on Cholo and Chola culture. Uh, it's a subculture, which is typically mostly Mexican and Chicano. Uh, but I focused on artists who um, center Cholo and Chola subculture. So for example, Vico, um, who you all know, she, she's been to SoCon and, and I featured her comics. I also featured uh, Paula Rascon, who's from Chihuahua, and she paints huge portraits of cholos. And so my goal as a writer is to bring to the forefront stories that are not normally told, which is stories of people of color. And, and also I want to put uh, brown women as protagonists. Um, and so I'm just really grateful that I got to meet a partner, Ronnie Dukes, because he brings my my stories that are in my head into a form that you all can hopefully enjoy and appreciate. So thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I'm Ronnie. I'm the comic book illustrator for dukescomics.com. And uh, I'm from the south, so uh, the south side of Chicago, South Shore exactly. Um, and growing up in Chicago, um, didn't get to play outside a lot. Uh, and so uh, it was dangerous, unfortunately. Um, and so I spent a lot of time drawing, consuming media, playing video games, things like that. And so that's really influenced my skills and also where I draw my inspiration from. Um, I've always been very encouraged to uh, continue my art with, by my family. And uh, they enrolled me in a program called Gallery 37, which was my first uh, professional job in the arts, which is where I studied fashion design um, and hat making. And, uh, and so like throughout an entire long uh, list of experiences and mediums and things like that, um, I eventually realized that I wanted to be telling stories and so, and put things together. And so uh, I decided to start uh, doing comic books. And uh, my first book was actually an adaptation, my first graphic novel, I should say, it was an adaptation of Alita's first um, feature length film uh, that she uh, worked on at uh, Columbia University. And so that film became our first book, AWOL. And I'm really, really, really pleased to announce that AWOL is available in English, it's available in Japanese, and starting yesterday, it's available in Espanol. <laughs> so we are very multicultural. Um, you know, I represent like the Mexican Chicana. Uh, Ronnie grew up African American, Black. Uh, his mother's Puerto Rican. Um, but also, you know, we've gone to Japan a few times now, and we also got to go to Tokyo Comic Con. So we love the whole uh, Japanese and Ronnie's. Uh, some of his artistic influences are anime, um, and so we're just trying to kind of be global and really reach out to people all over the world and, and specifically Japan because I learned about a, a cholo chola subculture in Japan. And so we're just trying to create bridges. 
Oh, I'm so excited already. I feel like, you know, obviously if we were in person, you all would be hearing me just like saying yes over and over, but you get the visual effect of it in this version. But I'm super excited to have you all together because I think that just even from what you've shared so far, you all are kind of working across multiple mediums. You're exploring a lot of different ways that you can do storytelling work. Um, and you're kind of embracing the like, just the, the rich nuances of how we can be doing these practices, um, depending on context, depending on audience, depending on just like a whole bunch of different factors. And to kind of segue into my next question, I wonder, um, maybe we can start with JM again. Um, but JM, kind of to build off of what Ronnie was just sharing about kind of his process of becoming an artist, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit like how did you kind of get your start creating? And you, of course, have this beautiful art lab behind you that I always love to draw attention to. But can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you got your start as an artist, as a creator? Well, I wasn't good at anything else, uh, especially sports. <laughs> so, um, you know, being asthmatic and all that. So, um, but uh, so just drawing when I was little, like probably four years old. And then, and then also discovering writing when I was in sixth grade. Um, my teacher, who I used to get in trouble with all the time, started talking about my writing. My writing, um, and and then incidentally, the teacher also lived in an apartment complex I lived in, in Barstow, California. So anytime I got in trouble, they could go to my door and um, you know, but um, so in that and getting kicked out of the whole art department senior year in high school at Oceanside, it's surprising I'm still productive when it comes to be creating things. So um, um, so that's what I like about art is being able to express myself, and it feels like the only safe area that I'm, I am able to communicate and express myself. So um, comics were obviously an influence, especially in Marvel uh, in DC, but especially Marvel and cartoons growing up. And then um, fine art. My background was originally in fine art, painting and drawing. And, um, and I tried to stay away from digital art as, as many decades. I kept trying to avoid it. And then it got to a point where I was publishing an anthology called BAM2, which stands for Big Ass Mini Comic. And it's 400 plus pages with over 60 creators involved. And so that was my first um, real publishing effort other than a couple mini comics. And it turns out I didn't know InDesign. <laughs> so, um, so we went through like five different graphic designers. And so finally I was like, okay, I guess for my undergrad, I'm gonna go become a graphic design artist in um, uh, media, um, you know, me media arts. Thank you. Um, and so, I got an undergrad degree in graphic design and media art so that way I can learn InDesign and never have the problem of not being able to put out a book when I wanted to put out a book. So comics is like, well, fine art might be my first love. I feel like comics are in my blood. I'm a third generation comic book fan. My grandfather had the first Supermans, the first X-Men's, you know, um, you know, he's passed on now, but then my uncles read a bunch of comics in the bathtub and ruined them all. So Goodbye, inheritance, gone. Um, and then my father, you know, who I didn't grow up with, I didn't meet till I was 11. Um, um, but he was even, even not knowing my father, he was a, a comics fan, you know, and Conan fan and, and like, um, was, it's particularly the Bronze Age and Modern Age Spider-Man, all that. So um, it's weird how you inherit traits from a person that you don't even know, you know. Um, but then when I did um, finally meet him, I, we, we discovered that. So now my kids, you know, are into comics and anime and things like that. So, I mean, you know, I couldn't name my kid Wolverine. So instead we just named him Logan, you know, Xavier. So, and my daughters are named after like aspects of comics, like Aria, it's a Filipino comic. Um, um, unfortunately, I think Jay passed away a couple of years ago. And then Aubrey, King Oberon, uh, King of the Fairies, you know, um, Gargoyles. So, um, and uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. So there's always influence I take from mythology. And so um, anything to tell a story in comics is the best medium that combines words and images and what happens in between the gutters to tell stories. And now, especially, um, I find that memoir and political social type of um, issues, I can translate and communicate, you know, in that, with that narrative, um, especially when um, it feels like you're getting drowned out and your voice is getting drowned out, so. You know, that actually, I feel like is a good connection point to the work that you do, Majid, in thinking about just kind of, you, you spoke a little bit about this already, but sort of the political art um, that you have created throughout the time you've been an artist. And I wonder if maybe you could share with us a little bit about sort of how you got your start as an artist, but also tell us a little bit more about some of the um, just themes that you explore in your art. And if you want to share your screen to show some of those, you're welcome to do so. Uh, 
Does it show now? I'm not seeing it yet. If you hit that green share screen button at the bottom, you should be able to. All right, you're good. Now we can see it. So the art, the, the projects I, are you talking about the projects? Yeah, so kind of how did you get your start as an artist and what are some of the themes of those works that you've been creating? Oh, okay. Uh, basically, I, I began creating political cartoons in, in 2005. I was influenced by uh, Najil Ali. He's a political cartoonist. Um, I was actually watching uh, a documentary about him in, uh, on Al Jazeera channel. And uh, this documentary really affected me. So I started, uh, I, we had uh, like an old book about his art. So I took the book and I started drawing about it. Uh, uh, drawing uh, the same drawings and after one month I, I drew uh, my own comics and uh, I got it published one month later which is which was a, a great achievement for me and little by little I became like a well-known uh, Palestinian uh, political cartoonist in the Middle East and when I came here to America I, uh, I decided to study art of uh, from scratch, like uh, I started at uh, Phoenix College in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And then I built a good portfolio and I applied for Columbus College of Art and Design. And then uh, they chose me to be a student there here, uh, which is, uh, I'm still a student and I will, I will graduate uh, this uh, semester. So basically Najil Ali was like, uh, the thing that really affected me that he was um, assassinated in 1987 because of his harsh criticism to uh, Israel, American, Arab leaders. And I was like, wow, that's, that's very powerful. So uh, I thought like from that time, like how powerful uh, art could be. So, and it's, it's a part of like nonviolence of protest that you can use, which is I'm gonna talk about like when I talk about uh, protest. Fantastic. Thank you, Majid. Um, if you can stop sharing screen, then that should take us back to being able to see everybody. And as you're doing that, perfect, perfect timing. Um, Rob, can you tell us also a little bit more about how you got your start as an artist? But I especially would love to know more about just kind of the, um, the children's literature work that you do. Um, and especially like, you know, you create really awesome stickers that I have some of and your Etsy shop is popping in terms of your really beautiful art that you've got there. And I would just love to know kind of how you got your start, but also how you've kind of um, created just all of these different works that that kind of, you know, expand across medium. Right on. Thank you so much for the support. I appreciate it. Um, is it okay if I share a screen too? Okay, let me pull up. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can make this live. Okay, so I'll just try to go through these quickly. These are some pictures of my family. I usually use this presentation for other things, but um, so this, one of the, the key aspects of my upbringing as artwork is uh, graffiti art. And so when I was a kid, um, graffiti was something that captured my imagination. And as I became a, a young man going to college, um, growing up with, parents that were activists, I always wanted to figure out how to implement some type of activism or some of my political beliefs into the artwork. And so that manifested itself by combining both the graffiti or murals and, and that. So I co-founded a collective in the Bay Area called the Trust Your Struggle Collective that morphed into a group that expanded to a lot of other places. So this is just some mural work that I've done or worked on. Um, locally and for kids books going back to what you said caitlin so uh, i became a dad really young uh at 24 and uh when i was a kid i really disliked reading I, I hated it actually and it wasn't until i became a dad that i understood why and it was because i couldn't find you know so many people have said this already but you know 
couldn't find books basically that reflected me. And so um, looking for books for my kid, I basically wanted to find books that reflected him and uh, my culture. And I could find a few, but not enough. So I decided to jump into uh, making kids books and focusing specifically on storytelling. And so I went through a phase where I was reading tons of comics, looking at lots of different types of film, animation, um, and then children's books is what really um, kind of captured my attention. And so this is uh, just some of my work in that realm. And, you know, I went the traditional route uh, where I approached publishers and all that stuff. But I got really uh, jaded and frustrated by that world because there's a lot of gatekeepers when it comes to uh, children's book publishing. And so I just... Uh, kind of dove into practicing both the illustration and the writing. I'm an illustrator first, but um, writer second. And so just learning about that. And then once I got into it, I you know, was able to, to meet uh, authors. This is an author named Melissa Reyes. She did a book about uh, a creek here in the Bay Area. And this is us reading to a classroom. Um, these are some of the, the books that I worked on. Um, and this is an illustration from one of the other books that I worked on uh, for Cons First Flat Top. Um, one of the other things that's a huge influence for me is uh, ethnic studies. I went to a high school that had that and uh, San Francisco State University that also had that. And so it was a huge impact on my uh, upbringing and just learning about uh, different forms of culture right out the gate. And so I, I try to use a lot of that into uh, my work as well. And I will stop sharing the screen now. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, this is great too. We can um, is it okay if I answer? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Is it okay if I answer a question now or should I wait till later? Uh, which, which question? Like? Uh, Maria Fritz asked oh, sure. a question. Yeah, go ahead, sure. Okay, so Maria asked uh, if you had any advice about getting involved in children's books. Um, what I would say, Maria, is to, it sounds kind of ridiculous. People always say, you know, you need experience to get the job and you need to get the job in order to get experience. What I would say is to start uh, self-publishing the same way, you know, comics has a huge, huge history of basically DIY, like do it yourself, write it, illustrate it, print it, publish it. I would take a page from the comics world and really do it yourself. And after you do that, uh, connect with other people who are very much on the same page. And then through that community, you'll be able to do what you want to do, uh, which is, you know, making children's books. Yeah, this is actually a beautiful connection to one of our panels from yesterday, which we were talking about the importance of having ethnic studies in K through 12 education. I think Rob just kind of spoke to kind of the, the beauty that can grow out of that. And I'm loving especially just the, um, yeah, the connections there of doing it yourself and kind of that also connects to previous panels from today of like, you know, as, as a lot of us, I think, talk about and explore in our work, whether it's in the university, whether it's in K through 12, whether it's in our daily lives, it's like, when you see it, you feel like you can be it, right? It makes a huge difference to be able to see those images. And something that we talked about yesterday as well is also the idea that like, who's creating those images matters just as much as being able to see those images, right? And the modes of production that, you know, determine what stories get told indeed are tricky to navigate. And it makes a difference when we see ourselves represented also within the larger industry, or even like as Brina was saying on an earlier panel with Christy, um, when we see the same folks or we start to form communities through cons and other spaces like this. And so this brings me to, you know, Ronnie and Elvira, I'd love to know a little bit more for y'all. I know Ronnie, you started to speak to this in your previous response, but just how y'all got your start, but also kind of some of the things that have been important for you in your process of creating. I know you just spoke about, um, you know, your graphic novel being in multiple languages, and I would love to actually know even a little bit more about why that's so important and just honestly so freaking kick ass. So talk to us. Sure. Um, I I relate to all the panelists. First of all, I have we have so much in common. Uh, but something that Majed said earlier about a documentary that really inspired him, um, you know. So I grew up here in El Paso, and and we didn't have ethnic studies at my high school or junior high or elementary. So I didn't learn about my Chicano history until I moved across the country to Minnesota, uh, where I went to college on a scholarship. <clears throat> And I started learning Chicano studies. Um, and I just started to realize that I just kind of got really angry at, you know, all the injustices that you learn about. And so I just started writing and I took every creative writing class that I could take in college, I took. Um, so like in a playwriting class, I wrote a play. <clears throat> and and uh, specifically, I had to write a play with three characters. 
And so I ended up writing a play based on uh, the murders of women in Juarez, which is the border town of El Paso. And that was back in um, like 1990. that has been published and um, and I kind of didn't want to go through the trouble of um, trying to secure copyright right I didn't have money to pay someone to get permission to use their work so so I just adapted my own play and made my film and and so the storytelling just kind of started there but even as a kid I was a really strange kid I used to draw storyboards um, and I used to make shoebox films <laughs> you know the ones where you 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 roll them and I used to force all the kids in my neighborhood to come over and I would serve them popcorn and pickles and then I would show them my movie you know and or I would do puppets and I would you know so I was always storytelling it was something that was always in me and and so now <clears throat> I just feel like we need to go even further you know what I mean and reach a wide audience and so um and there's also things that I for me and I know other artists probably relate to this art is therapeutic right so there's like you know things that we're dealing with that you know art and especially for me as a writer it just helps me to kind of <clears throat> deal with the things that that i've you know my experiences and my community um and so it's it's also a therapeutic process for me to be able to just research these topics talk to other people and then finally just kind of put a story out that hopefully other people can relate to and it informs them in some way um, well, I got my first job actually in the arts was actually with my uncle Fred, um, with Allen Productions. Um, I was probably in eighth grade, maybe seventh grade, and he had a production company in Chicago and, uh, I would help him with video production tape. I was basically his grip. I would tape down, ga you know, gaff down like chords and things like that. I would transcribe videos and it was really something that taught me a lot of patience. Um, and it also taught me to be professional from a very, very young age, um, which is something that was really beneficial to me as well. Um, I then went on to uh, study graphic design, or actually not graphic design, I went on to um, get my second job in fashion design at Gallery 37. By this time, I was maybe in high school. And uh, there I learned um, that there was a possibility to be a, a professional artist um, in many different mediums. Um, I actually had uh, one of our sister cities is Prague, uh, Chicago sister city. And so we had artists from Prague who came and taught us, you know, like different methods of creation, um, exposing us to their culture, language, things like that. Um, I then went on to um, study animation in college uh, where I got my degree. I got my degree in 3D, in 3D animation. And, uh, but the thing about 3D animation is it added a sense of, um dimension to my work and so after i got my degree i didn't animate a thing not even a frame um what i did was i used that information and i started painting and uh, it was right around that time that Vida got into columbia university and so we moved from minnesota to uh harlem um in the neighborhood of columbia and uh, i would go and find uh bits and pieces of wood uh, construction sites, uh, renovations, I would get whatever material I could get and I would paint on it, you know, and, um, and, and I took it to 125th street and I would sell sit out there like a blanket and I would sell my work and people would buy it. I mean, it was a great way to pay bills. Um, and, uh, eventually an administrator came by from Columbia university and offered me my first solo show. And so I've had about 13 shows of my painting since then. And, uh, but now that has now inspired me to tell stories and want to put everything together because when I'm doing painting, I'm, I'm really thinking about the story is the painting, you know what I mean? Or maybe it's the, the series or something like that, but it's really within the painting. So I really wanted to put something, make something that people could have in their hands, no matter where you are, um, that felt tactile. And so that's why I got into actual, uh, comic book art 
uh, and uh, working with Elvira and doing our first book. And now we're working on our second and third and fourth. <laughs> and uh, but also, too, I'm pulling all of these things together and I'm currently working in advertising as well. Um, so I'm work actually working in marketing campaigns uh, for small businesses um, using my skills now in animation and storytelling uh, production and putting it all together and creating actual uh, ad packets um, for people. And uh, that's been really awesome. And so to just really, if I can just add one more thing, our, our first comic book, uh, AWOL, um, was, as Ronnie mentioned, it was a screenplay. And I was trying to make the movie for about four years, trying to raise money. Um, I sent out so many packets to possible investors. And I ended up raising $5,000 that one person gave me, um, a local Chicano businessman. Um, and he uh, just gave me a check and said, go make your movie. And so we attempted to make it, but it was just extremely difficult with the little budget to make a feature film about the military. Um, I did call Fort Bliss and I was like, hey, can I make a movie on your base? And they're like, who are you? You know, and so it's like, it was just, so finally it was like, I was struggling to try to tell a story and Ronnie was struggling to try and get a story out as well visually. And so it was at that point that four years that we said, hey, why don't we just do a comic book? Like, duh, we need to just join forces and help each other. So then it took another four years to finish the first book. So in total, it took us eight years for our first book and we self-published. What I love about just what, what all of y'all are sharing is like you're, you're doing the work that you're sort of excited to do, but also the work that it seems that you're called to do in so many ways in terms of just thinking about um, there's so much richness in your in your responses and thinking about um, local histories, regional histories, right? I think sometimes for um, BIPOC, disabled and queer communities, we sort of, when we do get representations, they're almost, um, especially when we think about Chicanx representation or Central American representation, we see it, um, or mixed race representation, representation, like me as a biracial Latina, I think about this as well. Oftentimes we get a very limited um, kind of you know, idea given in terms of sort of where we're allowed or permitted to exist even, right? Of like, we're gonna be represented in like maybe one or two cities that we're gonna see across like all Hollywood scripts or we're gonna see sort of the same um, character design or the same costuming design. And so what I love is that you all are kind of pushing those boundaries and doing work that kind of um, moves across, or for, like of course across pages, but also across mediums when we're thinking about murals and clothing. I love the clothing thing in there too, Ronnie. I'm like living for your style. Um, and I'm loving just also thinking about how, how all of y'all's work has evolved over time. I think that's incredibly fascinating. And like, what's interesting too from each of you is that when you are coming up against these challenges, these, cha these challenges almost function as like points of of divergence, but they don't necessarily like throw you entirely off of the path, right? It's sort of, it's just moving slightly in a different way or, you know, finding ways to create slightly differently than perhaps what you set out to do, but still doing that project that you want to create. Um, which brings me to this year, 2020. Um, and Rob, I'd love to start with you on this one. Um, you know, you talk about a lot about sort of being a long time Bay resident and that being really important to the work that you do and just kind of your identity. And I wonder, especially in this moment of kind of environmental crisis especially but just more broadly in 2020 how the pandemic and just kind of the the uprising we've seen over these past few months how have those shaped kind of the the work that you want to create or even how is that perhaps influenced what you see art being able to do well uh first i think with uh with artwork it, it's one of the cool things about artwork is that it can cut through a lot of the the bs when it comes to informing people so you could look at facts you could look at statistics but um get capturing how someone really feels or how they felt um is just super important for someone who's not aware about a, a topic or a place or a person to really get it and understand it like in their core because they may have had that feeling or that experience before um, in regards to the um, to the uprisings and people protesting, um, what I think is really important is um, when Trayvon Martin was killed and when Oscar Grant was killed, um, I remember being out there painting and being a part of it. And there were, you know, a, a car area, and I think um, the U.S., like in different satellites who were making artwork about it. But in this particular case, when the the merging of and, uh, uh, all new, 
Oop, you're kind of freezing on us there, Rob. I don't know if you can still hear me on the other side. Um, let's see if maybe as hopefully we get Rob back. Jan, do you want to jump in in terms of just kind of 2020's like impact on you and your work and just kind of how you're seeing arts role, but also just how you're seeing yourself fit into kind of this, this year? Uh, sure. Um, so I'll share my screen on the next um, question, just because I don't want it in case Rob comes back, you know. Um, oh, Rob is gone. Okay. So I guess I'll share my screen now if that's okay. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. Hold on. Let me get it ready. Hold on, sorry, there we go. Is it working? Yes, we are getting okay. stuff, you're good. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is the um, Emanata Gallery, which is part of my CCA um, MFA in Comics um, uh, uh, exhibit. We, so to answer your question, how is COVID and everything affecting 2020? Well, um, incidentally, we had our in-person show canceled. So we had to take the first attempt to um, do a Emanata gallery show virtually at CCA. So my cohort, which um, is made up of nine other comic creators, here's me right here getting squashed by Godzilla, um, you know, right here, um, had to all of a sudden just like from scratch, figure out how to make the show work. And so um, here's Ness, who was on the last panel, that fantastic panel that just happened. And then, um, so thankfully I have a cohort, a support structure of nine comic creators that um, live all over the place that I can virtually um, basically um, touch base with and just ask for feedback or, you know, trade ideas. And um, so each one of us has a section here on this Emanata show. Emanata is a comic book term in regards to um, um, like, you know, type of visual things that pop up on a comic book page. That's that's what an Emanata is so like um like a sweat like an anime things like that so um so here's my work basically um I like to work with a lot of different mediums but I also like to work in a lot of um different genres so memoir was something that was unexpected when I joined the program um because I was expecting to talk about more like um things like you know um uh, systematic racism and things of like um historical um. Uh, uh, grievances towards marginalized groups, but having to confront those things, I had to confront my own issues that I was dealing with in regards to that, because some of the stuff is triggering, so being mixed race and things of that nature, um, as well as working on comics about people at the, at the border um, that are um, enslaved by ICE. Um, this is from Border X, you know, which um, Mauricio Codera is heading that, and that's part of Silicon's um, uh, planning uh, programming as well, so he'll be talking about that. But um, just being black and constantly being harassed, and then just um, this journalist cause comic right here um, features uh, Brina and some other comic creators, Guy Copes, another part of Silicon, and um, so being able to talk about these stories and um, vent, you know, like am I black enough? Um, again, another mixed race crossroads intersectionalism. Then also making fun of um, like white people who call the cops on people for being just black. Uh, you know, the Trump burger that was made into a glass, uh, a glass uh, sculpture that, that'll be featured on tomorrow. Um, being able to just kind of make fun of things as well is just my outlet for dealing with COVID and stuff like that. So I used to have abs, you know, it was a long time ago. It's, it's been a long time since I've seen those abs. Um, but um, I'll stop sharing. So just having the outlet, being, you know, having an outlet to be able to go and um, work in different, you know, let's call it an ADD approach to creating, right? So I, I, four pages, eight pages, and then playing with the ballpoint pen, and then doing markers, doing digital. And so it's like, you know, it's like, okay, I, I can tell a small story or a sample story right here, and then I can pivot. And if anything, it's, 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 it's my therapy, and it's what I have to do to try and keep things going here in COVID, besides stealing my kids' snacks since they're, you know, here at home, so... 
I don't even know if I answered the question anymore. So <laughs> no, I think this is fabulous. I think okay. that um, I, I've said this to, I mean, all the creators who I've spoken to in this last month will know that, you know, I've said all tangents, anecdotes, all of those are welcome. Cause I think that um, we are obviously seeking to collapse boundaries in general, but 2020, I think has formally collapsed any boundaries we previously had, but um, let's, I think we've got Rob back. So Rob, if you want to kind of return to what you were speaking on um, or build in new things that have come to your mind as you as you got to see JM's work on screens. Sure. Uh, what was the last thing you heard before it cut out? Um, you were kind of right at the beginning, truthfully. Okay. So I think we missed the good majority of it. Okay. So uh, in a nutshell, what I was saying is that uh, having both COVID and these uprisings at the same time was dope because in the past when I've worked on murals or artwork that was public, um, speaking about an issue, it was a few artists um, in little silos here and there. And when this most recent um, happening of uh, Rihanna Taylor and George Floyd and uh, Ahmaud Arbery, all these people being murdered, I think it having more people be out was just an amazing thing to see. It was really encouraging, um, not just for people marching and protesting and you know lighting, lighting you know police stations on fire but also making artwork that spoke to people who maybe would not have cared or would not have paid attention otherwise. And that artwork that was being created was very multi-generational. You had OGs out there, you had new artists and people who had, you know, have already been working on their careers. So that was really awesome to see. This I think also connects well to Majed. I think your work, this might be a good opportunity for you to show us a little bit more. Um, because I know you've, you've had some really interesting experiences as a Palestinian creator coming to the U.S. as you started to speak about, um, just in terms of thinking about how your work has been received. And so I'd love if you could tell us a bit more about the themes that you explore, but also just other challenges you've faced in terms of the, how your work has been perceived at times. Uh, so you're asking about um, how, we are, how am I affected by uh, the 2020 events or just talk about my project? I think if you want to talk about both together, I think that'd be fabulous. But definitely, I think let's maybe start with your work. And then if you want to talk about kind of how 2020 has perhaps affected it or changed it at all. Okay. Um, so uh, in 2020, I have been working on several projects. The first project is, is called uh, Uprooted, a short comics uh, series of comics. It uh, focuses on refugees. The idea is to interview some refugees and emphasize their story. Uh, basically, I'm going to focus on their journey of oppression and journey of uh, struggle that they have been through and, um, and the reason why they had to flee their countries. Uh, and this experience that they have been uh, through, the main goal of it is to make their voice heard. Um, the, uh, I started this story with my father's experience in 1948 when he was five years old, when him and his family had to flee their village uh, by the Zionist movement because of the massacre that they committed to other villages. So they were scared, so they had to flee their, their village. Uh, the result was that the, the death of his mother, uh, uh, that uh, when she was 25 years old, and the death of his infant, uh, sibling um, because of the poverty, cold, lack of medication, lack of food, lack of uh, water and like they had like a really huge poverty back then. The other uh, project I'm working on it's called Without Prejudice. It, it was my thesis uh, last semester. It's a 22 page comics. It's a memoir focuses on my experience as a political cartoonist uh, who was invited by the American consulate in Jerusalem to participate in the International Visitor Leadership Program in the United States. And after they granted me the visa, they canceled my visa because they thought my drawings are anti-Semitic and objectionable. And the story actually focuses on uh, the media confrontation after the rejection because I published about the story in the media. And they even talk about it on, on Fox News and they had an interview with me on BBC about this particular story. And also I, 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 uh, I wanna show the reader how the life would be in Gaza Strip uh, with, with a constant shelling, 
lack of food, lack of freedom to travel, lack of electricity, um, uh, constant wars, unstable political situation. The other project is the Ink Man. It's uh, a story about an artist who lives in a refugee uh, camp. Uh, he, his dream is to invent a, a holographic ink to draw in three-dimensional way in the air. Uh, he collaborated with his friend that he's a physicist, so they, they had to expose a uh, certain type of ink to a certain type of laser beam to get a modified ink to test it and make sure that it's going to draw in three dimensions. It's, it's a fictional thing. So basically, uh, the artist uh, uh, accidentally drank the, uh, drank the modified ink instead of drinking coffee and uh, changed his genetic DNA and he became the ink man. So uh, he faces uh, his villain. His villain, is, his name is uh, the Armor, who owns the uh, weapon factories. So the ink man fights him because he believes that the uh, weapon industries are uh, the reason of the destruction uh, in, in the countries and killing people because they want to make certain weapons and, and make a profit out of it. And we are seeing uh, a lot of examples here in America about the gun laws and how they are pushing to keep the, the, the status quo how it is. So these are uh, most of uh, the things about the projects that I'm working on. These are some examples. Uh, do you want me to talk about the pandemic or we can talk about it later? Yeah, definitely. And also, I just wanted to say your work is beautiful. Like, I, I, I'm really excited to get to kind of have this time to look at it as you're telling us a bit about your, um, you know, your like kind of the experiences and the, the different things that have informed it. But I would love to definitely hear about, you know, how has the pandemic in 2020 you know, influenced you or your work as a creator? Yeah, for, for, the, for the pandemic, uh, uh, actually, it's definitely harder. And being at home all the time is, is, is really difficult, uh, especially for me, I don't like to be at home a lot. But it, it didn't affect me as, uh, as much because I work and I, I go to school. So I produce a lot of, uh, I, I have been very active, like, drawing and going to work and writing. So the pandemic actually made me realize that I am on the right track of criticizing these topics that I'm listing right here, which is capitalism. It showed the pandemic exposed how bad capitalist system is, how bad the health system is, because it's mostly it's designed for the 1% of the whole population of the, of the United States disregarding other people and we we saw in the the election and during the primary uh, of the democratic uh, the primary we saw how all politicians like clustered against bernie sanders because he he was trying to push for socialism trying to push for medicare for all free education because this is going to be a threat for them to um for, for for their profits and for it's, it's basically corruption. That's what I, that's all what I can say about. It. Uh, when it comes to the protest in, in 2020, actually, coincidentally, like I was writing an article uh, for a comics literature with Dr. Uh, Robert Loss uh, about uh, about uh, during spring semester. I was uh, I wrote an article about about nonviolence and nonviolent resistance using comic book is called the March. March is, is written by uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis. And I used another comic book called Martin Luther King uh, and uh, Montanary Story and the method of nonviolent resistance that they used during the civil rights movement. So I wanted to reflect all this onto the Palestinian resistance and, and try to uh, come up with an idea how it could be done in Palestine. Um, so uh, it's funny that two weeks later, there was a protest um, because uh, of the death of uh, George Floyd. 
um, uh, George Floyd. Um, actually, like what happened in the protest, like enhanced what I have been working on and made me think that I'm in the right direction uh, in either my art and uh, by academic research talking about uh, colonialism, orientalism, and war journalism, and war media machine, the, 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 the mainstream media, how they are pushing this um, kind of white uh, man agenda. Uh, currently, I'm working on an article about a book called uh, uh, Citizen for Claudia Rankin. It's, uh, it's kind of like a bunch of lyric essays and uh, talks about racism and discrimination. So basically everything that like, happened in 2020 just support what I have been working on. And I think I'm in the right direction. And that's it. Thank you, Majed. I think that's really, really powerful. And I, I love the words you just use. It's enhancing and it's, you know, it's strengthening kind of the the path you are already taking in your work. I think that's a really poignant way to put it. And I would love to go to Dr. Elvira and to Ronnie, kind of how, and I'm especially interested in something that I noticed in your work is that like local politics is something that you two really think about and what comics can do. And I'm, I would love to know a bit about how 2020 shaped or perhaps use Majid's language kind of enhanced the work that y'all have been doing, whether academically or comic wise or fusion of the two. Sure. Um, I can agree with you more, Majed, um, and for several reasons. So I'll start with first my dad. I always talk about him because he's a great influence in my life. Uh, he was a Marine and he didn't talk too much about his service, but what, they, what he would talk about was when he came back, uh, he says that when they would drive, <coughs> drive up to a diner and he was dressed in full Marine uniform that he still, the him and like the men of color had to still walk to the back of the diner to enter. Um, and so he used to talk about that. And I know that's something that really affected him. Um, my dad in, in many ways taught me how to sort of stand up for myself, especially when it came to these kinds of issues. I remember another time we were at a grocery store and there was a man like selling candy or I can't remember exactly what he had, but it, it I don't know if it was popcorn. And my little brother put his hands on the glass like to see what the man was doing. And the man said something derogatory, like get your greasy, get your greasy hands off of my stuff. Or and and I remember my dad like told him something like, like, don't talk to my son like that. You know what I mean? And then we just kind of walked away. Um, and so my dad kind of always taught me to like, you know, call people on on things, you know, like especially when they're being derogatory or racist. Um, and so what I learned about myself is that in, in my college years, right, when I went to college and especially like at Columbia, I mean, that's a very elite institution. I mean, I obviously was like a minority there, you know, out of 70 students in my class, it was like maybe two Latino Americans. I was the only Chicana. Um, and so I always found myself uh, bringing these. And so by the time I got to Columbia, I had just gotten a Chicano studies degree, right? So I was already like, you know, into politics. And so when I got to Columbia in my classes, especially my screenwriting classes, I would always kind of, I don't wanna say call out, but I would bring up concerns that I had about my classmates work. And so obviously that like made me an outcast, you know, like I was the most unpopular person in my class. I didn't get invited to the parties and, and which is fine. You know, I was always very determined. I was always like working on my own stuff anyway. Um, and and even like during my PhD studies, again, I kind of found myself sort of being the odd bob because of my politics, because I would bring things up that I feel are important. And so I agree with Majed that, you know, what's going on this year just kind of, you know, says like, no, I've been on the right side of history this whole time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to stop now. I'm still going to, you know, call attention to these things. And I'd rather be surrounded by artists like all of you who are conscious people and who do want to, you know, change the world and, and make it a better place, right? Um, and so, um, so the politics has always just kind of been part of my upbringing. Um, and of course, El Paso, because we're home to Fort Bliss, uh, one of the largest military installations in the country, um, there's always politics, right? There's always, um, you know, with the immigration and the border and the highly militarized presence, um, it just, the issues are always at the forefront and there's always like this tension. Um, and so 
so my work has always reflected that. So in the past, I've written a lot of plays. Um, for example, um, in the early 2000s, I wrote a play called Pigs, which stands for Pimps, Illegals, Gangsters. And it's about police corruption, but it's sort of in a absurdist world where the the pigs are actual pigs, you know, they have like pig features and, um, and the people are, are sort of creating this uprising and this plan to overthrow this new world. And so for me, what the pandemic did is one, um, it made me want to revisit all of these projects that I have. Uh, Ronnie and I have like a whole, we have like 20 projects that we're trying to, to do. Um, but this whole time, my dissertation has just been like hanging over my head. And so what I accomplished during the coronavirus was like my dissertation. I was just like, I got to finish this. I got to be done so that I can move on and, and now do like, you know, incorporate my research, but also revisit these plays that I've written. And, and we want to put them into, gra into graphic novels or comic book form. Um, and so I'm just more excited than ever. Um, right now, a project that I'm excited to jump into this fall um, is actually a musical that I'm writing. It's called uh, Border Ballet Twinkle Toe Patrol. It's about um, a coyote who, uh, her business is, it's like the last mom and pop coyote business. In other words, they, they help um, Im immigrants enter the country with dignity and, and safely. And uh, whenever the Border Patrol shows up, um, her name is Ivana, she uses uh, dance and music to put the, in, uh, the Border Patrol in a trance so that they can escape, you know, come into the country. Uh, so it's sort of like, it's definitely politics. It's, it's a mixing Kabuki theater with uh, Chicano, um, like Luis Valdez type of farm worker uh, theater. Um, and, and it has to do with like immigration and, uh, and definitely the border. Um, and so I'm excited to start jumping into that project. I'm working with a local, um, artist here in El Paso. Her name is Amalia. She's a, she's a singer. Um, she was nominated for a Grammy. Uh, so hopefully we'll be working on that. So sometime later this semester, we're going to have a public reading. So of course you're all invited. Um, it's going to be a virtual reading of the play. And so hopefully that'll lead to a production at some point. So, um, so basically nothing, I haven't changed, you know, my politics haven't changed. If anything, it's just made me more focused. And now I want to start going down my to-do list and just start checking things off. Um, I guess for me, it just feels like the world just kind of caught up to the world that I've been living in my entire life. So I'm like, you know, I feel like the, all of this is, is for the people who didn't know, you know, like I've, I've watched, um, I've watched as a spectator, I've watched uh, drive-bys. I've seen like a lot of horrible things as a child, you know, like dealt with a lot of realities and stuff like that, um, that kind of put me in a different United States than what people think, you know, cause I'm at home watching the Brady Bunch as somebody's getting shot outside of my door, you know, outside of my house. And, and you just, you just start, you, you, you put your head down. You know what I mean? That's, that's the only thing you can do is you can put, you just put your head down and we've had our head down for so long. And I think that now with the pandemic and the protests and things like that, it makes me realize that everybody has to contribute. Nobody can be, nobody can afford to put their head down. You know what I mean? If there's somebody, something horrible happening around you, you running and ducking for cover isn't helping anything. Um, and so I'm putting myself out there with my art. Uh, um, I'm participating now in politics, um, trying to get the first Latina mayor um, elected to El Paso, Texas. Um, and that's also, that's a long time coming. Um, and mm -hmm. she's at, uh, running up against, you know, white men and people with money and you know, people with influence and, and things like that. And, and we need to fight back against that. You know, we've started a group called Artists for Beto. Her name is Veronica Carvajal. So if anybody has a chance, check out BetoForMayor.com and please support her. Um, and so it's, it's important for me to be involved. And also too, it makes me realize that art, no, that life imitates art. Mm -hmm. um, like the whole thing with, uh, basically we're living, we have Akira days, Akira days, and we have Blade Runner, 
you know, kind of coming together on top of us here, uh, on top of a little bit of contagion and so many other things, you know what I mean? And, and, and the thing is, is we've grown up, especially us Gen Xers and, and X millennials and things like that, we've grown up with a dystopia um, as a part of our normal media, you know what I mean? Everything is dystopia. And so one of the things that I wanna do is actually uh, go the Gene Roddenberry route. Um, Gene Roddenberry, shout out to El Paso, actually he lived here, um, but uh, he created Star Trek. He was a lead, lead creator for Star Trek. And he is credited for coming up with the idea for the cell phone, uh, the tricorder, which is actually something that people are using now to like, you know, tell people's health by using actual just a device where you can just hold it away from them. Um, you know, so it's important for us to be futurists and to provide a blueprint for the future. Um, one of my things that our new book that's coming out um, and for everything that's coming out for, for us from now on, my whole thing is solar punk. Um, I think solar punk is definitely a, a great uh, other end, head, uh, other side to the coin, so to speak. So if we have people growing up with solar punk, growing up thinking that math is cool, growing up thinking that it's okay to doodle and, and, uh, and engineering, growing up trying to create their own energy sources, you know, like being, uh, uh, getting into good trouble, right? And also creating positive change. Um, I think that is definitely the future and it's our responsibility to create that um, because, I mean, if you look at the president, I mean, like we have the Space Force, which is an exact bite off of Star Trek. You know what I mean? We have like so many things that are exact ripoffs of, of, right. of sci-fi of arts, you know what I mean? And so we need to create the art that's going to inspire people, to inspire lazy people to do the right thing. I also wanted to just add real quickly that I thought it was beautiful to see uh, protests all over the world after George Floyd was murdered. Um, and, and again, that just goes to show how our message needs to be broadcast across the ocean around the world, you know, not just in our, definitely in our communities, right, but then amplify it because, you know, there's power in numbers, right. And so um, so I, I thought that was beautiful that the whole world just kind of took note and paid attention. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important point too in thinking about um, something that's been on my mind quite a bit as we sort of come to a close is um, something we saw a lot from activists I think over social media was calling on folks who were feeling energized to listen to the leaders in those local communities, right? Sometimes there might be a temptation to sort of, um, you know, dive in and you're not sure how to dive in and you may accidentally sort of speak on behalf of, or sort of speak over, I should say, instead of speaking with or amplifying the voices of other people. Um, and I think that like this, this also makes me think of how, you know, one of the most important steps that we're trying to continuously do, right, is, is make sure that like black leaders, indigenous leaders, um, queer and disabled leaders are being heard and are being centered and that we're doing that amplifying work. Um, especially when we think about as a lot of activists drew attention to, right, there was sort of more attention paid in some ways to um, the murder of black men than to black women um, or black trans women, right? We still don't see sort of a, um, a concerted focus on making sure that when we're talking about black lives matter, that we're really being conscientious of that, like, you know, black trans lives matter, black disabled lives matter, black women, like everybody really like within that sort of umbrella of black should be, um, should be cared for and amplified and shouldn't just be cared for after sort of a, a violence is enacted. Um, and so this brings me to JM, something that I always love to hear from you, JM, and that I think that you speak so beautifully to is, you know, thinking about the name of this panel of sustaining the momentum, I wonder if you can kind of speak about, since I think this is something that's really been kind of on your mind and on your heart, um, the where do we go from here question, or sort of what did the next steps look like? And I would love to just hear from you, you know, just in pulling from all of these experiences and, and all of these influences on your work, but also you as a parent, you as a human, right? You as a mixed race person, all of these different influences, just how do you see, or what should we be thinking about in trying to sustain this energy that we've brought to 2020 so that we don't lose it or perhaps um, don't build upon it following the election or following 2020? Um, yeah, that's going to be an uphill battle. I feel like um, while there was, you know, uh, which I, I also acknowledge that those protests 
um, um, all around the world, which was really good to see, knowing that, wow, it's, it's global now. Um, there are still some issues when it comes to actually being heard, I feel like, especially if, if you are, um, sometimes there's, I wanna, I'm just going to say it, sometimes white people want to co-opt your, um, your fight or, or, or get in front of it, and, they're, and, and by getting in front of it, they're blocking you. You know, um, when, when um, BLM hit, uh, there was a lot of people doing art and just kind of going out there. And it was just like, it's like, I felt like I was drowned out. I'm not going to lie. You know, it's, um, I know as an artist and as a, and as a person of, of mixed race, I felt like I was drowned out from some people that, while I appreciate having allies and I definitely feel like it's good to have people on your side, it's also good for, you know, for them to listen and maybe like, hey, you know what, you know, um, and then there was a bunch of publishers and industry people going, wanting to reach out and, 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 and you know, if you're a, a black or you know, a person of color, um, you know, get in touch with us. But I never saw any follow through from that, you know, so that was a bitter lesson to acknowledge that's like, oh, okay, so we're going to play with the optics and we're going to talk about it, but we're not going to follow through. And in the next month, we'll be on to some other bullshit, you know, so um, basically that led me to believe that, um, okay, you know what? We still have to carve out our own niche. We still have to create our own space, make our own space. Um, so that way our books, our art, our voices get out there. Stuff like SoulCon. SoulCon is so important to me because that's what we do with SoulCon. And it's only getting bigger. And we need like 20 SoulCons. We need to have them happen globally, regionally. You know what I mean? It has to be an all year round thing. Um, you know, it can't just be um, the, uh, the, the social media topic of the month, you know, and that's what really bothers me is that I feel like a lot of us have been screaming for a long time, generationally, you know, and then so and like the other day I mentioned reparations and some white lady's like, no, that'll just cause chaos. Well, I'm sorry if you can't handle it, you know, um, it shouldn't be my problem that you and the rest of the people who don't agree with reparations um, can't handle things being uncomfortable you know it shouldn't be my problem but but guess what will happen they'll make it our problem because they're you know they're still killing us they're still holding us back from advancing um there is no generational wealth we built their generational wealth for them they've got everyone tricked into thinking that you should have a labor force that only serves the top percentage you know if they people have got it twisted they think that it's a problem if you have a country or a global um, movement to try and make life easier and and happy for people. So we can't have um, climate control. We can't have, um, well, we have to have poor and hungry people. We have to have disenfranchised people. So that way somebody can buy another yacht or have another island, but we can't spread that around and, and, cause, and, like, and do away with the fact that money is just something made up. You know, and then like 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 a business has to be a business, bullshit. You know, what I mean, people should be able to be people and not be a cog in the machine. So I didn't mean to go rage against the machine against anyone, but but um, I was just I just get pissed off when I think about all the potential innovation that's out there right now, and everything like that that all these bright minds can be creating and innovating, you know, all over the world and. We're told, no, you must accept the status quo as it is right now. This dated senior, you know, white hierarchy of, of, of old men who aren't even in touch with what's going on today in the, in the current um, blend of, of flavors that we have around, you know, globally. So. Woo! That was a beautiful, like, bringing us right to a close, Jam. I love that. I wish there was a mic that I could virtually drop, but also a physical one I could drop. Um, I hate to cut our conversation off here um, because I feel like we were honestly just touching the tip of the iceberg there, but I want to give you my sincerest thanks, um, especially also in the chat. I appreciate all the affirmations that have been sent to panelists, but I also, before I hand this over to my dear, beautiful friend, Peyton, um, I just want to also center the fact that like all of our creators who participated in SoulCon are doing this work as BIPOC folks, as queer folks, as disabled folks, right? Um, doing this in a pandemic and during, doing this work during an uprising. And so I ask like, 
whatever capacity that you have to give those affirmations to folks today, but also after the fact, I think it's really important because I sincerely appreciate that y'all are doing this work during this really hectic and awful time because you really bring this energizing light and force that honestly gives me a lot of hope. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and thank you for being phenomenal panelists. And I'm gonna hand this over to my dear friend, Peyton, who is gonna take us to our final panel of SoCon 2020 Synchronous Programming. Thank you, Caitlin.